Happy Sabbath, everyone. Indeed, we are very thankful to be here another Sabbath morning. God has been good to us. He has woken us up this morning, and we are here on this blessed Lord's Day to give him thanks. Even though we are still experiencing a partial shutdown, so to speak, many churches are still closed, and as you can see, we are still here uh, ministering from Pastor Nott's home. But indeed, we ought to give God thanks because it could have been much worse. And we have a lot to be grateful for. And so this, this morning, indeed, I thank uh, the Knotts family again for having me here into their homes as we worship God together and as we seek to enlighten, enlighten and to share God's word with those that are viewing us. So thank you for choosing Wellington this morning for your worship service, and I pray and hope that as we share God's word, you will be enlightened, you will be blessed, and you will also have a word to share with others as you go from day to day. Please remember that this afternoon, Pastor Nott will be back at, will be here at five o'clock to share his message, and he is continuing the series, The Desert Lesson. The, uh, desert Lesson, okay, the... Uh, context and the crisis or the series so please just remember that he will be here at five o'clock to share that context and the crisis so please after you have had this message get some rest and be back so that you can via live stream to see what pastor has to say for the end time that we're living in and so this morning we are continuing which Bible version can you trust? This is our sixth installment, and I hope and pray you have been blessed by it. And I do pray that you are going back doing your research. Be like the Bereans. Go back and see if these things are so. And this morning we're going to be looking at translation of the King James Bible, the 1611 version, the current version that... I subscribe to and others as well I know and for good reasons we have gone through five lessons so far and we have shown you the history why we subscribed to the KJV and this morning in particular is going to be more of a history lesson we're not going to go so much into the scriptures as yet but it will be how the the Bible was how the King James Version was translated. We're going to be looking at the translators and do a brief bio of King James himself because many people believe that, well, the Bible was written by King James and therefore it can't be God's word because it is called the King James Bible or the King James Version. We ought to know these things so that we are able to give an answer for the hope that is in us. Now, without further ado, we are going to ask God's blessing on his word, and then we are going to get straight into this morning's message. So please kneel with me as far as possible. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear God, that you have brought us here, and we are here to open your words this morning. May you help us, dear God, that as we study your words, that nothing will be said that will cause confusion. But we pray your Holy Spirit will be our guide and you will impress your truths upon the mind of your people. Be with my mind and help me that as I present your word, it will go forward with clarity and in truth and sincerity. In Yeshua's name we pray and ask his mercies. Amen. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and go with me to our opening text, which is found in Colossians. This is the text we have been using as a platform for the studies that we have in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. The Apostle Paul here is speaking to the church at Colossae, and he admonishes the church that they ought to be wise because the devil, he is a very cunning and serpent, have a serpent-type mind. 
just as how he deceived Eve. And so the Apostle Paul here now admonishes the, the church in the Colossians, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. And he says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And there is a lot being said today on the pulpit about philosophy and few words that are being spoken about the word of God. Everything now has been philosophized. And this is coming from the catechetical school down in Alexandria as we have studied before. Everything was shrouded in mystery and it was a form of everything was allegorized down in that former school and so we have here the apostle paul is admonishing the church and this admonish comes down to us today that we ought not to let anyone spoil us or deceives us and for that reason C.H. spurgeon says that as the apostle paul said to timothy so also he said to us that we must give ourselves to reading he says we need to read he says, renounce as much as you will all light literature and study especially the Puritanic writers and expositions of the Bible. And we're going to be looking at a few of the Puritanic writers this morning because believe it or not, it is through the providence of God working through the Puritans that we have the King James Version Bible this morning, the pure unadulterated word of God. He says that the best way for you and I to spend our leisure is either to be reading or praying. And I'm telling you, I am praying for God to give me the spirit that these Puritanic authors and these, these writers, these men that they had, they had a spirit that was diligent. They didn't find time to do other things that was gratifying to the flesh. These men were about God's business. And as a result, we have their legacy today. And I subscribe to the Puritanic writers. These men were truly God sent. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Paul says, all things must be proven. And when all things are proven, we must hold fast to that which is good and today many of us are giving up our good old king james 1611 version for these other versions without even studying and knowing the facts and knowing the background of these other versions all things must be proven and so we're going to look deep into the mind of these translators that gave us what we have today in the 1611 version. Now, just for a quick review. The last time we were here, we went through seven of these Reformation Bibles, starting from Wycliffe, coming all the way down to the Bishop's Bible. Now, we discussed that the Geneva Bible was pretty much the Bible that was used the most. It was the, the, the most beloved Bible. And we learned that it was the Geneva Bible that the first English Bible we had the verse divisions all throughout. The first English Bible, all of the Bibles before that, they didn't have verse division. And the Geneva Bible was the first one. It was also the first English Bible to italize words, put words in italic that was not found in the original Greek manuscripts. And we have that today in our King James Version. And we also learned that in 1611, when the Puritans came here to America and they landed on Plymouth Rock, we, we, we learned that it was Geneva Bible that they took with them here in the United States of America. It wasn't these other versions. It was the unadulterated word of God and so we learned also that after the Geneva Bible then came the King James Bible of 1611 which is the most famous of all the Bibles during the Reformation period now this is the most famous and influential of the English Reformation Bibles 
It is called the King James Bible or the King James Version because its production was authorized in 1604 by King James I, who ruled England from 1603 to 1625 in Britain. It is more commonly called the Authorized Version. And a matter of fact, the reason why it is called the authorized version in Britain, it is because it is crowned copyright. We're going to talk a little bit about that when we get to the printing of the King James Version. Outside of Britain, it is not so much a copyright Bible. If it's outside of Britain, you own your King James Bible if it is printed outside. But if it is printed in Britain, then it is crowned copyright. Now, let's do a little biographical sketch of the king himself, King James, as was named James Stuart from 1566 to 1625. Let's look at the man, the, the man who authorized the version, just a brief bio of who he was. Now, from 1566 to 1655, he was first named King James VI, of Scotland before he was King James I of England. He ascended the throne of Scotland in July 1567 at age 13 months when his Roman Catholic mother, Mary Queen of Scots, from 1542 to 1587 was forced to abdicate. So she had to give up the throne for some reason. And Mary Queen of Scots, she was a Roman Catholic, but we are told that John Knox, who was a Scottish reformer, when he prayed, we're told that Mary's Queen of Scots feared John Knox's prior, priors more than all the armies of England. And so we find that she was the mother of James Stuart. So he was James VI before he became King James I of England. Now, James became King of England March 1603. Upon the death of Elizabeth, he was the closest living relative of the unmarried childless queen, being the son of Elizabeth's cousin, and he was the one that united England and Scotland. And so Elizabeth, she was the Protestant. She came after Bloody Mary. And so when after her passing, King James was the next in line because she had no one to ascend the throne. He was married to Queen, Queen Anne of Denmark and had about, I think, eight to nine children, King James. Now, James was known as the most educated sovereign in Europe. He was no dummy, so to speak. He was a smart man, understood many languages. Among these justifiable attribute refinements was his reputation as a paragon of learning crammed with Greek and Latin and other tongues in spite of his physical disabilities, his mind was first rated. So he had a brilliant mind. He was a brilliant king. He could not be thrown around, kicked around, or bounced around. Note now, one of the major events in James' reign was the gunpowder plot. And I know you must have read of this or heard something about it along the way. Now, attempt was made by Roman Catholic agents to assassinate the king and the queen. And parliament by exploding barrels of gunpowder in a room underneath the House of Lords. The plan was to kill the king, seize his children, stir up and revolt with aid from Spaniards in Flanders, put Princess Elizabeth on the throne and marry her to a papist. So you see here from early on, the Catholics, their intention was to remove a Protestant from off the throne of England and to put back someone there who would promulgate their agenda of pushing and bringing out their papal teachings, bringing back England under the umbrella of the papacy. And so God thwarted this plot because in the providence of God, he saw that just a year later, God will work upon the king's heart to give authorization for the word of God. And so God, in his wisdom, he prevented James from even being injured in this plot. Now, soon after King James assumed the throne of England in 1603, following the reign of Elizabeth I, 
he was approached by a group of Puritans led by John Reynolds, president of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, and presented with the Millennium Petition. This called for spiritual reform in the Church of England along Presbyterian lines, and it got its name from the fact that it was signed by an estimated 1,000 ministers of the Church of England. So these Puritans approached King James because they wanted a reform in the Church of England, and they wrote petitions after petitions. Oh, that today we would write petitions to have reform in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We saw some things last week from Pastor Nat's sermon, the things that are happening in the Adventist church. It is a shame, beloved friends. If our pioneers who started by the grace of God, this movement should get out this morning, they would not recognize this movement for what it has become. And petitions need to be written out and mailed off to our leaders of this movement to let them know we need a revival, we need a reformation, we need a reform in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Many have become us who are really not of us. They know not the history of this movement. And as a result, we are where we are and we are just floating along down the stream. Praise be to God, we have men who will cry out and cry aloud for the abomination that is happening in Israel. Now, these Puritans, they were encouraged to pursue their objective by the fact that James had been a Presbyterian in Scotland. So, from early on, James was a, a, he was a Protestant at heart. His true colors were not yet fully known, according to the Puritans. A three-day conference was held at Hampton Court, January 1604, to discuss the petition, and it was here that the decision was made to make the King James Bible. So it was during this discussion of reformation that they wanted to have in the Church of England to bring about certain reforms, that the petition by the Puritans was made to King James to have a Bible authorized by him. Now, I'm going to read the preface to the original 1611 King James Version written by Miles Smith. And this is what it says. For the very historical truth is that upon the importunate petitions of the Puritans at his majesty coming to this crown, the conference at Hampton Court having been appointed for hearing their complaints, when by force of reason they were put forth, all other grounds they had recourse at the last of this shift that they could not with good conscience subscribe to the communion book now this was not in reference to the bible this was in reference to what the church of england was using in conjunction with the bible because we know that the church of england they had the bishop's bible and they also had other bibles that they were using but this was in reference to the communion book the communion book now, and though this was judged to be but a very poor and empty shift, yet even hereupon did his majesty begin to bethink himself of the good that might ensue by a new translation, and presently after gave order for this translation, which is now present unto thee. Miles Smith wrote this in the original 1611 version in the Prophets. Now, Let's discuss for a moment the groupings and the locations of the King James translators because all of this play a very important role in this book here. So, note now, within six months, a list of 57 scholars was drawn up for the work. There were a total of six companies they met in the three cities, Cambridge, Westminster, Oxford. The translators began their work in 1604 and finished it 1611, a total of seven years. Now, 57 bright-minded men met together in three different locations. And we're going to see why this was so important. 
Now, they had the Westminster group. They had the Old Testament and the New Testament. They are referred to as a company. So the Westminster group, they had the Old Testament and the New Testament group. In Oxford, they had a company for the Old Testament and they had one for the New Testament. And the Cambridge group, they had a company for the Old Testament and one for the Apocrypha. Now, you remember we discussed briefly concerning the Apocrypha that it is not, they did not consider the Apocrypha a part of the canon of Scripture. It was there for historical purposes. And this is from Payne's book, The Man Behind the King James Version. We're going to talk a little bit about that book. Note now, the King James Bible is translated from a superior Old Testament text. It is translated from what we call the traditional Masoretic Hebrew Old Testament text. The word Masoretic comes from Mesor, our Hebrew word meaning traditional. So in other words, this traditional text, this Hebrew Masoretic text, it is the text that has been used by the Jews from the very beginning. And it is the traditional text that has come all the way down. This was the text that was used for the Old Testament in the 1611 version. Now, this is very important because we're told in Romans chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. What advantage then had the Jews or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way chiefly because that unto them, underscore that word were committed the oracles of God. Now, who is the them here? The them here is referring to the Jews. God gave to the Jews the oracles of God. Now, if you look up this word oracles in the original language, the Greek language, it comes from the word logos. And we know that in John chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. That word in the Greek language is logos. So we find here that the oracles of God means the divine declaration, a statement originating from God. So God gave them the words that they penned in the Masoretic text. They were the custodians of the word of God. They were the keepers. And so, this text has come down to us. Now, Daniel Boomberg edit 1516 to 1517 what was called the first rabbinic Bible. Then in 1524, this is important, now note this, in 1524 to 1525, Boomberg published a second edition by Jacob Ben Kaim. Now, this is called the Ben Kaim edition of the Hebrew text. Daniel Boomberg's edition on which the King James Bible is based was the Ben Kaim Masoretic text. This was called the second great rabbinic Bible. This because the standard Masoretic Masoretic text for the next 400 years. So what you find is that the Masoretic text was the standard text that came all the way down for the next 400 years. Has not been changed. Now, the Ben Kaye Masoretic text was used even in the first two editions of Biblia Hebraica by Rudolf Kitty. The dates on those first two editions were 1906 and 1912. He used the same Hebrew text as the King James Bible translators. So this Biblia Hebraica that was edited by Rudolf Kitty, he used this Hebrew text from 1906 to 1912. Until there was a shift. All of a sudden, 
1937, Kittel changed his Hebrew edition and followed what they call the Ben Asher Maseratic text instead of the Ben Chaim. They followed it that the text, the Leningrad Codex Manuscripts, otherwise known as B19 or L, which is, they said that this text is dated to 1008 AD. The reason why he had switched from the other text to the Ben Asher text, it is because of the later date of this text. It is the same reason that the New Testament Texas Receptus was switched. Those that translated into the new versions was switched from the Texas Receptus to the text that is now called the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus because they believe that these texts were earlier. And so today we find that these new versions of the Old Testament, they no longer use the ben Kaim Hebrew text. They now use the Biblica Hebraica edited by Rudolf Kitty. Now let me tell you something. Our seminaries today, if you go to school to study Hebrew, the text that is used is not Ben Chaim text. The text that you will get to study is the Biblica Hebraica edited by Rudolf Kitty. And this text has over 30,000 changes to the original Hebrew manuscript. So even the King James Version, and they will tell you in their preface that they have used this Hebrew text also to translate the Old Testament. And that is the reason why you cannot trust no other version but the 1611 King James Version. Because it used the traditional Masoretic Old Testament Hebrew text edited by Ben Kaim. Now, the New Testament which we have already discussed in Lent, you have this, the Alexandrian, the Latin Vulgate, and the Codex Vaticanus that was present at the time. The King James translators did not not for a single moment made reference or have taken anything from these manuscripts. Now this is very important. These men understood, beloved friends, that these manuscripts was a corrupted Greek manuscript. Just as how the Ben Asher manuscript for the Old Testament was a corrupted Old Testament manuscript. And so the New Testament Greek manuscript that they used was as is known as the received text or the Texas Receptus. I had to put this one bowl for you to see. And I gave you the names and all these names mean the same. Antiochian, why? Because the missionary church was located in Antioch. And it is so interesting Satan always find a counterfeit for everything that God have. Everything. You think about it. He has a counterfeit for everything God produces. God gave a man and a woman. He puts two men together and two women together. God gave you the Sabbath. He says Sunday. God gave the Masoretic traditional Hebrew text. He comes in and he now gives you the text that has been corrupted with over 30,000 changes. He gives us the Antiochian text, the received text. He comes in and he gives you the Alexandrian text. He has a counterfeit for everything God produces. 
And it is so interesting that even today, this text, the received text, because of Westcott and Hort, the whole world has gone after now the Nessa Allen and the United Bible Society text, which is an outline from the Westcott and Hort critical Greek text. They the whole world has gone after them. Our church is using it. All the other little denominations out there, they're using it. God bless the few that still hold to the Texas Receptus King James Version. 1611 that is now the Texas Receptus that underlines the King James Bible or the New Testament was Beza's fifth edition of 1598 we already discussed that to some degree it is a text that hasn't changed it hasn't had a revision in the last 381 years today when you check the Nestle Allen Greek text they are now at this, I think it's the 26th or the 28th edition of their Greek text. If it is so pure, why are they editing it so much? 26th edition? If it is so pure. But here we have, for 381 years, the received text has not been edited. We don't need it to be edited. Because it is God's pure word. No edition. Until of course we have the King James Version. The new King James Version that came along in 1989. And then the, 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 the full test, Old and New Testament was produced in 1982. They tampered a little bit with it. And that's why we have, when you read it and you match it up with the 1611 King James Version, there's over 2,000 changes. And we're going to talk a little bit about that when we get to the other versions. Now, when you check, beloved friends, from 100 AD coming all the way down, and I'm going to put these on the screen. I'm not going to elaborate on them. You can go back and rewind at your leisure when you're watching to see these. But you find that from 100 AD coming all the way down, the true church of God has always been using the Texas Receptus, the received text, known as the Antiochian text. They've always been using it. All the apostolic churches, they use the received text coming all the way down. The Gallic Church of Southern France, the Celtic Church of Great Britain, Church of Scotland, the pre-Waldensian Church, the Waldensian Church, the Gothic version, they use the received text. The Orthodox Church used the received text. We know Erasmus, he used the received text. The Compatelsian Church, they used the received text. Luther used it, Tyndale used it. The French version that was written by Olivathon, he used the received text over there in France. We went through all these Bibles, they used the received text. Beza used it, the Italian version, they used the received text. The Elzevir brothers, they used the received text. Go back to your leisure and look through them when you have time. And so from the apostolic age come all the way down, they used the pure text. Not that corrupt Alexandrian text that was made down in Egypt. Now, Alexander McClure, 1858. This book. And I brought my copy so that you can see if you need to get one. I'm primarily going to be quoting directly from this book in regards to the translators and the method and how they approach the Masoretic Hebrew text and the received text of the New Testament. Now, I'm going to talk about three of the King James Old Testament translators. There are 57 of them. Now, we don't have time to go through all 57, so I'm going to just going to highlight three of them and highlight their accomplishment 
at this moment. Now, when you think of the accomplishment of Lasselat Angers from 1568 to 1628, this man, it is said that the world wanted learning to know how learned this man was. Now, this is a profound statement, beloved friends. I had to read this statement three times just to get it into my frontal lobe. The world wanted learning to know how learned this man was. He is known as the star of preacher. And today, I believe we ought to pattern this man's life closely. Now, Dr. Andrews, he was the president or the director of the Westminster Group that translated 12 books together from Genesis to 2 Kings. That was the task of Company One. Remember we said that there were six companies, three different locations. So he was the president and the director for the Westminster Group, Company One. Now, he acquired most of the modern languages of Europe at the University of Cambridge. He gave himself chiefly to the Oriental tongues and to divinity. So this man had a wealth of knowledge when it comes on to linguistics. He had studied many languages. Dr. Andrews prepared for himself manuals wholly in the Greek language for his private devotions. Now, you're talking about manuals for your devotions. This man was an English-speaking man. And he produced manuals, not for the public, but for his own devotions in Greek. Some of us don't even have a worship manual. A devotional manual to speak with. Not to mention to put it in Greek. <laughs> Such was his skill in all languages, especially the Oriental, that had he been present at the confusion of tongues at Babel, he might have served as interpreter general. That's in this book. That I have here. That's how learned this man was. And let me tell you, it is said that when he speak in any languages, you would think that he, it, he is speaking in his own mother tongue. That's how well he knew those languages. Now you think about it. At Babel, at the confusion of tongues, he would be the interpreter general. In his funeral sermon by Dr. Birkenridge, Bishop of Rochester, it is said that Dr. Andrews was conversant with 15 languages. I, I mentioned this to my wife yesterday. She's trying to learn three. She's trying to learn German, French, and Portuguese at this time. She says she finished with, 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 with Spanish. And she says she's struggling. <laughs> and she has every material at her disposal. This man knew 15 languages. This man was a formidable scholar. And he was present, active in the translation of this book. What about the accomplishments of William Bedwell, Bedwell from 1562 to 1632? Dr. William was also in Company One at when Westminster Group translating the books of Genesis through Kings from Hebrew into the English language. Sec he was justly reputed to be an eminent Oriental scholar. All these men spoke different languages, all of them. It is said that to him belongs the honor of being the first who considerably promoted and revived the study of Arabic language and literature in Europe. Arabic. It is said, thirdly, he spent many years in preparing an Arabic lexicon. 
You know what a lexicon is? A dictionary. And the commencement of a Persian dictionary and an Arabic translation of the epistles of St. John by the same scholar are still preserved among the Lord manuscripts in the Bodleian Library. So this man was no ordinary man. You're talking about translating Arabic, creating a dictionary and the Persian language. It is said, fourthly, that his fame for Arabic learning was so great that scholars sought him out for assistance. That's how brilliant this man was. McClure says in his book, The Translators Revised, he said, Some modern scholars have fancied we have an advantage in our times over the translators of the King James days of 1611 by reason of their greater attention to which is supposed to be paid at present to what are called the cognate, the cognate or the Shemitic language, especially the Arabic, by which much light is thought to be reflected on Hebrew words and phrases. It is evident, however, that Mr. Budwell and others among his fellow laborers were thoroughly co conversant in this part of the board field of sacred criticism. So today you find these are the languages that are being used today. Oh, the translators, they didn't have, they didn't know much of the other languages to compare with the manuscripts. And so what we have is the incorrect translation. Oh, yes? You tell me which of these new funny version translators that can speak 15 languages that have translated from Arabic and the Persian language creating a dictionary. You tell me of any one of them. What about the accomplishments of Miles Smith, the man who wrote the preface for the 1611 version? Now, Dr. Smith was in Company 3, the Oxford group. That group translated a total of 17 books from Isaiah through Malachi. He was one of the 12 translators selected to revise the work after it was referred to them for the final examination. We're going to talk about that in a little minute, in a little bit. Now, Dr. Smith was employed to write that most learned and eloquent preface to the King James Bible, the 1611 version. He went through the Greek and the Latin fathers, making his annotations on them all. There were 100 church fathers that wrote extensively. From 100 to 300 AD, there were 200 more who wrote from 300 to 600 AD. He read through all of them in Greek and Latin and made his own comments on each of them. These are the minds of the men that gave us this. They were not the authors, but they were the men that God used to translate it from the original language into the, king, into the English language. Fourthly, he was well acquainted with the rabbinical glosses and comments. These are marginal comments in the Hebrew language. It is said that so expert was he in the Chaldee and the Syriac and the Arabic that they were almost as familiar as his native tongue. A matter of fact, it is said that there were 6,000 volumes in the library at Oxford and only 60 of them was in the English language. Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Those were the language that learned men when they were having conversation. Those were the language that they spoke in.
He had at his fingers, Hebrew, it said he had at his fingers an extremely proficient man and, 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 and certainly had all the qualification to translate our King James Bible. So this man was an ordinary. Chaldee, Syriac, and Arabic, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. All packed in one brain. Now, company two. This group now that translated the New Testament. And I am still quoting from Alexander McClure's book. Now, let's consider Henry Salville. What were his accomplishments? Sir Henry Salvin was in Company 4, the Oxford group. That group had the task of translating six books, the Gospels, Acts, and Revelation. So they were in Company 4. It is said he became very early famous for his Greek and mathematical learning. Secondly, he became a tutor in Greek and mathematics to Queen Elizabeth. Now you had to be learned to be tutoring, teaching the queen. You can't be no novice. You got to know something. It is said that he translated the histories of Cornelius Tacitus and published the same with notes. Tacitus was a Latin historian, and this man translated his works into English. You go up and look up this man. Cornelius Tacitus. Look him up. This man translated his works into English. However, he is chiefly known for being the first to edit the complete work of Christosium, the most famous of the Greek fathers. John Christosium had many papers that he wrote to the people to whom he ministered. And Salville was the first to completely edit his work. His edition of a thousand copies was made in 1613 and makes eight immense follies. Folios, rather. A folio is the size of a large dictionary or an encyclopedia. These are the works of the men that perform the translation. So this man weren't no fool. What about John Boyes? He was in Company 6, the Cambridge group, which translated all the books of the Apocrypha. Now, John McClure says, Alexander McClure rather said, the sixth and last company of the King James Bible translators met in Cambridge. To this company was assigned all the apocryphal books, which in those times were more read and accounted of than now, though by no means placed on a level with the canonical books of Scripture. So that's clear. Now, he wrote... A book of com in a book of common prayer that he had from his mother. This man was taught diligently by his father and by his mother. And he said this. John Boy said this. This is my mother's book. My good mother's book. Her name was first Marble. I don't even know. This is what? Polly? Polly. And then afterwards... Marble Poyes, being so called by the name of her husband, by Father William Boyes. She had read the Bible over 12 times and the Book of Martyrs twice. 12 times. He said his mother read the Bible and the Book of Martyrs twice. It is said that at age five, he had read the Bible in Hebrew. Age five. Some of our children can't even read at age five English. And this man is reading English. This man is reading Hebrew at age five. 
By the time Boyce was six years old, he had not only wrote Hebrew legible, but in a fair and elegant character. Now, it's one thing to be reading Hebrew. It's another thing to write it. And he's doing that at six years old. It is said that he soon distinguished himself by his great skill in Greek, writing letters in that language to the master and senior fellows at his college. Fourthly, in the chambers of Dr. Down, the chief university lecturer in the Greek language, Boyce read with him 12 Greek authors in prose, the hardest that could be found both for dialect and phrase. It was a common practice for this young man to read and study in the university library at 4 a.m. and stay without intermission until 8 in the evening, a total of 16 hours straight. Now you wonder, <laughs> today you can hardly stay up to read for an hour. This man goes to the library at 4 in the morning and he leaves at night. He was one of the 12 translators who were sent, two from each company to make the final revision of the Stationers Hall in London. So after all of these men completed their translation, there was a final revision and he was chosen as one of them to perform the final revision. It is said that he left at his death as many leaves of manuscript as he had lived days in his long life. That's what McClure says. Now look at this statement carefully. He left manuscripts, as many leaves of manuscripts that he had lived pertaining to the days of his lives. Now you think about it. He lived from 1561 to 1643. So you think about it. For every day that he lived, he left a leaf of manuscript. 82 years, my sister. That means that he has a total of almost 30 thousand leaves of manuscript did you get that this man was brilliant you ask one of these modern day translation translators if any of them could read at the age of five not to mention reading Hebrew at five years old Writing it at six years old. You ask one of them. But they are quick to criticize these men that gave us the translation in English. What about John Reynolds? This is how they wrote it back in the day, but it's really R-E-Y-N-O-L-D. But they wrote it like this back in the 1600s. What about, he was the one you recall that proposed to King James for the, new tra for the translation of the Bible. Now it is said, Ian Pearsley here in my plea for the old sword, Pearsley said he had been an ardent Roman Catholic, speaking of John Reynolds, and he had a brother who was an equally ardent Protestant. They argued with each other so earnestly that each convinced the other the Roman Catholic became the Protestant, and the Protestant became the Roman Catholic. What a turn of events. <laughs> you imagine <laughs> arguing with a Roman Catholic, and you convince the man to become a Protestant, and the man convinced you to become a Roman Catholic. But this man held fast to his faith. Matter of fact, one famous writer said that on his deathbed, John Renner's deathbed, and he didn't live to complete his translation. But while he was working on his translation, he fell sick. And it is said that during his decline, the company to which he belonged met regularly every week in his chamber 
to compare and perfect what they had done in their private studies. His days were thought to be shortened by too intense application to study. When urged to cease his labors, he noble replied that for the sake of life, he would not lose the very end of life. This man work, toil, faithfully by the grace of God. Even when sick unto death, he was still working on the translator, translation. We are quick to throw away our King James Version. Call it old-fashioned. What a shame. Now these are just three men. Out of 57. Just a group of men. Now there were some rules in regards to the translation. Let's discuss them a little bit. Each translator had to translate the books on his own. Hey, no help. This, this was a individual translation. They came together eventually, but each man had to translate on his own. Now, the Westminster group, let's talk about them for a minute because we discussed that they, they translated the Old Testament, and, Old Testament and they were company one. Now, these men had to go through Genesis, Exodus, all the way up to 2 Kings. We discussed that they had to translate 12 books. Right? Now, every one of those men had to translate on his own. So in other words, for every group, there were about seven to eight men. And each man had to translate all 12 books on his own. The Westminster group, they translated the New Testament. 21 books in total. And each man, each man had to translate each book on his own. 21. What about the Oxford group? Old Testament. They had to translate 17 books in the Old Testament from Isaiah to Malachi. There were eight men on that committee. Each man had to translate all 17 of these books the men were, you have their names right here. You can go back and look at it at your own time. What about the Oxford group for the New Testament? Each man had to translate six books. The, 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 the Gospels, Ox, and Revelation. What about the Cambridge group? Ten books in total. They had to translate. And then you have, for the New Testament, the, 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 the Cambridge group, they also translated the Apocrypha. Now, these 48 names are listed in the British Museum, says Payne in his book, The Man Behind the King James Version. So there are 57 total of them. Now, in regards to the rules of translation... King James had set up some rules. And if you notice, King James was not a part of those 57 men. Though learnt in many language, he was not numbered among the 57. You go back and look at the slides to your own time and tell me if you see King James' name there. So there are People who, and I just pity them. These are people who are unlearned. Who will come and tell you King James write the Bible. They know not of the history of this Bible. Now rule number eight. That James laid out. Very good rules. He says, every particular man of each company to undertake the same 
chapter or chapters. And having translated or amended them severely by himself, where he thinketh good, all to meet together to confer when they have done and agree for their parts what shall stand. So this was a rule that King James implemented. So if there are 17 books to be translated, and there are eight or seven men on that team, each man had to translate 17 books. Go back through the 17 books and adjust or amend by himself. So in other words, if you take company one, that has to translate from Genesis through 2 Kings. An average of seven men on that committee each had to translate every book, every chapter, every verse by himself. You wonder why it took so long. Well, rule number nine. As any one company has dispatched any one book in this manner, they shall send it to the rest to be considered of seriously and judiciously, for his majesty is very careful in this point. This is what is recorded. So when the translators in company one had finished their translation, the other companies, they had to now send it to the other companies to be looked over. So, for instance, when the seven men looked at it, they had performed their translation. And then, all together, after they had performed their translation, the seven men now come together to review what they had translated. That's eight times they have done a review. Then the first company now sends it to companies two through six to be looked over again. This now makes it what? Five more times that it has been reviewed. They interchange their work here. You have the material gone over now what? 13 times. And then at the end they have a final joint of two men from each of the six companies, 12 men, this makes it how many times? 14 times. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation was translated, analyzed, and corrected. 14 times. And that was not even enough. For instance, rule number 10. If any company upon the review of the book, send doubt or differ upon any place to send them worthier of with the place and with all send the reason. So after the review has been made and it is now sent to the other companies for revision, when the other companies went over it, if they find some place where they think that there should be a better rendering, they make their notation and then send it back to that group. Now, if that group decided that they don't believe with the rendering of the other company that has sent it back for revision, guess what happens now? To which, if they consent not, the difference to be compounded at the general meeting which to be of the chief persons of each company at the end of the work. So in other words, if that group did not believe in regards to the correction that the, the other companies thought that should be made, and they said, we're not going to change it. When it is now sent to the last company, that those are the, the 12 men from each group, that's when now they now take into consideration whether or not any correction is to be made. So no one man couldn't go in and say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I see a word I don't like, I'm going to change it. Oh no. 14 times it went through revision. 
before it was given final authority to print. Rule number 11. It is said that when any place of special obscurity be doubted, letters to be directed by authority to send to any learned man in the land for his judgment of such a place. Now think, now, I just gave you a synopsis of these men's mind. And it is said here that if there is a place where there is obscurity, where it is not clear to their mind, then others outside of the companies, the six companies, were to be consulted in regards to what they think of such and such a word. So not only were these men were the one that played a vital part, but other learned men were also consulted. So every step was taken to give us the correct rendering of the Greek and of the Hebrew. Every step. And today you find, <laughs> oh, this is an incorrect rendering. This is an incorrect word. Now, I'm not saying everything is perfect. That's not what I'm saying. But the steps that were taken there were judicious scrutiny. Everything was scrutinized, analyzed, and they seek to give us the correct rendering because they know that they were translating the words of God and not some men's words. Rule number 12. He says, letters to be sent from every bishop to the rest of his clergy, admonishing them of, the tra of his translation in hand to move and charge as many being skilled in the tongue and having taken pains in that way to send his particular observation to the company either at Westminster, Cambridge, or Oxford. Letters were sent out to other learned men in other parts to give their mind, their thinking, and what they think should be and what should not be. All of this was taken into consideration. And then at the end, the final 12 men came together and made the final adjustment. And so as I bring this to a close, as far as the Redex Index is concerned, it is said that it can't be understood by children. Uh, some grown men, they, they can't understand it. The, the language is too old. Now, this is a software, the, the writer reader is a software that is used. And this was used to see whether or not what portions, what difficult portions of the Bible, what grade level. It is that the word can be understood. Now, here's the list. Genesis 1. Readability, 8.13. Grade 8. The highest is 10th grade. And you're going to tell me that your children can't understand the language of the King James Version? And you're, you're going to tell me that men who are learned go to school in college and so on and so forth, they're giving up their King James Version because they're saying it is too hard to be understood? Don't you think that if God knows that the language was going to be too hard to be understood, he would have changed it? Don't you think he would have? Oh, yes, he would have. And so what we have here in this version of the 1611, these men meticulously came together 
None of these translations that we have, dozens of them, have come together in this fashion to produce any translation in the history of our time. None. None of them. What I have shown you, beloved friends, is the broad outline of how God worked in such a way. And that's why you can see that the devil is angry with the King James Version. You can see why. It is because of the carefulness that has gone into it. And I pray next time, I'm going to show you when we now begin to break down the words of how they meticulously choose the words. If the Hebrew says this, they find a word in the English language that matches to the Hebrew word. Not some equivalent. Word equivalence. Form equivalence. In Hebrew, if it is a, if it is a noun, it is translated into the English language as a noun. If it is a verb, it is translated into the English language as a verb. Today, you don't know. They have now switched pronouns to nouns and nouns to pronouns. There's no grammatical rule in these new versions. Now, are you say, are, is that important? I'm going to show you that it is very important. Very important. No rules. These men knew better. That this was God's word. And they had to take care that just as how God has put it down. That is the way it is to be carried over into the English language. I want to know what is so hard to be understood by Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 30. What is so hard about that? That it cannot be understood. When you read, come unto me all he that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. What is so hard that you can't understand this? You say your children can't understand this. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and he shall find rest unto your souls. For my burden, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is so hard to understand about this? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. These are plain English language. What is so hard to be understood about these words? And so, beloved friends, a time has come for us to know what we believe and hold to what we believe. Don't let these little smart Addicts come and tell you that King James is the one who was responsible for writing the Bible. He had no part to play. As a matter of fact, these men weren't even paid. <laughs> they were Puritans, men that believed in thus saith the Lord. And they gave their time willingly and freely. So that we can have today the unadulterated word of God. And so this morning, in the words of Jude 3, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. I hope and pray this morning that you have been enlightened I pray that you have been blessed and you can go back over these things because I know a lot of it may be confusing into the, in the mind as you think of these things. Go back and look and go back and share so that others can become wise unto salvation. I hope and pray that God will bless you and keep you. Jah will cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Please remember this afternoon to tune in to Pastor Nott at 5 o'clock. 
5.30, as he continues his series, The Context and the Crisis. May God bless and keep you till we meet again. Amen.